Uh, one of the things, there's a couple housekeeping items that, uh, that we need to go through. Uh, one is that essentially uh, there's been a little bit of a change in the way the uh, continuing education uh, hours will be measured. Uh, in the past, essentially, there was a, just a, a sign-in sheet that you would turn in at the end of the conference uh, where you would essentially uh, turn in the, your hours that essentially you said you were in attendance. Uh, this year, essentially, uh, we've had uh, some people in the past that haven't necessarily uh, spent the time in the, uh, in, in the uh, training sessions. And so, uh, working with uh, how to record, uh, a change has occurred. And what you may have noticed is there's a couple uh, white cone type items at the doorways. And also, in your badge, there is a, a radio transmitter. So essentially, when you walk through the door, uh, that particular uh, radio signal uh, logs your ID, which is an individual ID into the computer system. And then when you leave the room, there, it also records when you have left the room. So this, the, you are being electronically monitored when you enter and exit the, uh, the training sessions. So essentially the slide says, continuing education or trade so, show, it's your choice. So you have a, uh, from the standpoint of the program, uh, you're being logged as far as the time that you are within the training session rooms. So if you are essentially wish to spend your time in the exhibit hall, that is your choice. Uh, but if uh, during the sessions, but you will not receive continuing education hours for the time that you spend in the, in the uh, trade show area. So, uh, and, and so if you need the full amount of time that's available to you, then you're going to have to be in attendance of all of the, at least in one of the rooms of all the sessions. Now you go, well, wait a minute, Bruce. I want to leave during part of the session. I'm tired of listening to you. I want to be out of here. Uh, a little bit earlier, I got something to do. That is okay. Uh, but you need to realize that when you leave, it's going to log to a uniform hour and it's going to, or excuse me, half hour, and it's going to round down to the nearest half hour. So if you were here for five hours and 45 minutes, you're gonna get five, hour, five and a half hours of credit. So that's how it's gonna essentially log it in the process. So that's just a, tr a change that has occurred, and so you just need to make a choice. So if you're gonna leave, you know, wait for 35 minutes. Okay, in the process, in the deal. So anyway, so that you get at least a half hour of, uh, of credit for sitting here in the process. So it, it is something that uh, we have to work with with this large number of people. And so it's something that's uh, been, uh, been incorporated in the overall trade show. All right, so I, I don't know if there's another slide here uh, in the deal. And this shows uh, the uh, white booth that you walk through. And that's essentially what those things are doing is they are recording as you pass through uh, with your uh, radio frequency. And we want to thank Ray for being the uh, person here that uh, demonstrated walking through the door. All right. Go ahead and proceed with the presentation. Uh, from the overall, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to visit uh, this year. Uh, this is a little different year. Uh, the Texas On-Site Wastewater Association is... Uh, putting our hosting conference, and essentially this is the 25th uh, anniversary of the Texas On-Site Wastewater Association, and uh, so that was one of the reasons why uh, they were looking at uh, this uh, trying to be a, uh, a special year in order to kick things off. And so my presentation today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, past, present, and future wastewater in Texas as uh, we look at uh, uh, how we're moving forward. Uh, there are a lot of chairs up front. You're welcome to walk up. Uh, it doesn't bother me if you want to walk in and uh, move in uh, as, we're, uh, as we're discussing. As we go through uh, the, the uh, presentation, what I'm going to discuss is, is kind of talk about some of the rule revisions we've gone over, uh, see how uh, the goal uh, for on-site sewage facilities that we have here in the state of Texas, how they've been changing over time. And then also look at uh, how those uh, rule revisions actually support and help us in meeting those uh, changing goals. 
And then I want to look at some of the uh, licensed professionals and how uh, their importance in meeting those uh, long-term goals for uh, water treatment. And then we'll describe uh, some of the uh, aspects that some of these uh, systems can do or OSSFs can do for meeting our long-term needs here in the state of Texas. So part of what we want to do is, why are we here? Why is the on-site sewage facility industry important to the state of Texas? And this essentially defines what is your significance. Why are you significant to the state of Texas? Well, one, people. We have a lot of people that essentially want to become Texans. Essentially, I don't know what the number is every day, uh, but it's over 1,500 people a day essentially are going up as far as the number in Texas. Yeah, the number is that you have over 500 that are born a day and you got over 1,000 that are moving in. So as we have more and more people, we have to take care of them. And one of the things that we all have to deal with is that we generate waste, okay? And there's only two ways that, that you can appropriately deal with the waste. Essentially, you can deal with it with on-site facilities or you can deal with it with centralized sewers. And so, with the on-site facilities, we are the ones that can essentially make that happen. So as we have more people, we have continuing demand for, for uh, services that this industry provides. The second thing is water. Every one of those people needs water. And, and so, how are they going to get that water? And so, the water that we have, people want to ask me the question, they go, when are we going to run out of water in the state of Texas? And the answer is, we're not. We have lots of water in the state of Texas. The issue is we're gonna run out of cheap water, okay? And so we have water, it's just that we have water with stuff in it. And so what is your job? To get the stuff out of the water. So that means that you have a long, term ability in order to uh, meet the needs here in the state of Texas. And what we're dealing with is it's a public health and public safety issues. And so those aren't going to go away. And so the industry is here for the long term. And as we deal with the water, you got to look at the environmental health and environmental safety because Mother Nature can only handle so much and we have to remove the material from the water to make sure that it's available for people to use as a drinking water supply and meet that fishing and swimmable needs that we have. So as we look at the rules and how they've evolved over time, uh, we've had on-site rules or for different uh, septic systems uh, for many, many years. A lot of it was in the health department, then it went into the Texas Water Commission, TNRCC, and then into TCQ. And so as we look at the changing of the agencies, but part of what it was in 89 is when we really got a, a discussion of a comprehensive statewide rule of our on-site sewage facilities. Then essentially in 97 is when we had a uh, drastic change where we started in, a, in changing of the, of the professionals. We broke apart a lot of the different professionals. We had the site evaluator, installer one, installer two, designated representative licenses, all those essentially were redone starting with the 90, 1997 time frame. Then in 2008, we revised them again and that was more or less that revision period where we looked at shifting it where maintainability and making sure that we could meet that long-term goal of operation and maintenance on the systems kind of brought it in. And that's where you had the maintenance provider, maintenance technician, uh, became level in the playing field with the other professionals and the maintenance provider became a second, seven, uh, separate licensing. And then in 2012, we had some public safety work that essentially came through with, uh, with the risers and making sure the securing of the systems to make sure we address that public safety issue overall in the process. And, you know, people ask me at times, they go, well, you know, your rules keep changing. Are the rules really that bad in the state of Texas? I would tell you no. We have a pretty good set of rules in the state of Texas. And part of what we look at is we look around what other different people have because you always want to see what other people are doing. Part of what we have is we deal with a prescriptive code. And for the two type approaches you can have is prescriptive or performance. And a lot of times, prescriptive has always been if you have this size house, this many square feet, 
of a facility, you need a wastewater system with this volume or capacity for treatment. So you have a number of bedrooms, square footage leads to a size or capacity of a treatment system. And then you essentially, you design that facility to go in or treatment system to go in for that home and it is supposed to meet the water treatment needs. A performance goal is different. Essentially what you say is you have a facility, somebody needs to design a system and we're going to monitor it on a regular basis. And if it doesn't meet the performance goals, they need to upgrade their facility to meet that need. And typically that is associated with centralized sewers or larger wastewater treatment plants. But in Texas, what is our on-site rules? We essentially have a blending of those two. We have a prescriptive code, which essentially a lot of ways says, if you have this size home, this many bedrooms, this many square feet, you need a treatment system that has a capacity of X gallons, 240 gallons, 300 gallons per day. What is the capacity that you're designing to? But the other side of it is, we have some performance criteria. If you go to advanced treatment, you're supposed to be checking disinfection systems. If you put a treatment system on a commercial operation, you're supposed to be evaluating whether or not that treatment system is meeting the BOD and TSS criteria that we're after. So Texas gives you a blended between the prescriptive and performance in our on-site rules. And that's how that performance side is supposed to be the ability to make sure systems continue to operate and meet the changing goals that people have. Because when you put a system in for a restaurant and they say they're gonna serve a hundred meals a day, what is that restaurant gonna to try to do? Serve 75? No, they wanna serve what? 150, okay. Well, is it your fault as a designer that you put in a system or, or the permitter that put in the system for 100, gallon, or 100 meals a day and now they're doing 150? Is it your fault the system's not working? No, it's their fault because they decided to put more use to it and the performance side is supposed to catch it and say, hey, if you're selling a lot more meals, you should share and upgrade the treatment system in order to be able to handle that many meals in the process. And so that's how the performance-based system is supposed to work, is that it helps catch people that are doing well in order to be able to make sure that we can continue to treat the water. If they're not doing well, then essentially they can meet, stay in that minimum side, but the, but the prescriptive with a performance criteria is how we can meet our long-term goals of having good water resources for the state of Texas and protecting public health and protecting public safety and environmental health and environmental safety. So how do we evolve? You know, essentially, when you're talking to people uh, and you say you have to have an aerobic system for treatment of your wastewater and you need to put it out with a spray system or a drip system. And they tell you, well, my grad, your granddad talked about the septic system with the trenches and field, why can't I have that? Because I don't understand why I can't have what, what my granddad had or what my great granddad had in the process. And so what we've dealt with is you've got to realize that we have evolved in our rules to meet our changing goals. And so we started out with outdoor plumbing and not many of us really want to go back to that, but essentially we had to pit privy. It gave you a way to designate the place of where you're going to put your wastewater. You didn't need a carrier to carry the waste because you transported it to the pit privy and that's where you essentially deposited the waste. It put it directly in the soil so the soil could provide it. We isolated it, which meant the public uh, health concerns and the management was you had to dig a new hole. Okay, and so from the standpoint of when it filled up, so from that was fairly simple to operate as a treatment system. But we decided that that was a little bit uh, inconvenient. So we wanted to go be able to go to the bathroom in the house. So once you put the plumbing inside the house, now you got to get it out of the house. So the easiest way to get the wastewater out of the house is add water. Okay, so we add water to the waste to carry it out. And we need piping to get it out 
of the house. And so originally we weren't uh, per se that we didn't have uh, high population issues or density issues that would mean that we would lead to environmental concerns. So we essentially needed to keep it working. And the definition that the system worked was that the toilet flushed. Okay, so as long as you kept the pipe open, they were happy, okay, in the process. And so it was, uh, it was one of those times when you could drive down the road and when you saw the two foot diameter elephant ears, you knew you found the pipe, okay, in the, in the deal. So it was a situation that people did what they thought was best in order to meet the management. Then we moved into disposal. We said, wait a minute, we really didn't want this wastewater to be on top of the ground, so we needed to get it below the ground surface. So we went into disposal. We wanted to limit it human contact, so we put things in the ground in order to collect the waste and make it go away. So you had various unique items that people used in order to get the waste below the ground, and essentially a lot of it was the 55-gallon drum. Okay, It made a good place in order to get it in the ground and dispose of it. But did we really get the treatment? Because we were, not, uh, we were not necessarily using the soil to the best ability. And so we had challenges that we weren't necessarily getting to where we needed to be with the long-term water quality. And so then we changed from disposal to dispersal. We wanted to disperse that water into the soil because the soil became the attention for treatment of the wastewater. So we needed to change our rules so that we didn't just get the wastewater uh, go out of the house. We wanted to put it in the soil to get the treatment. And so we started focusing on how are we removing those uh, wastewater contaminants to get the stuff out of the water by using the soil. You need the, the aerobic soil. We were able to start addressing the environmental concerns as well as public health and public safety concerns. and. Uh, with the conventional system, you still had limited management. But what we, def what we realized as we switched into that idea of trying to treat with the soil, we realized that not all soil is created equally. So now you have to pre-treat the water to a different standard. So how do we decide? We had to look at it from the perspective of how much organic do we, matter do we need to remove? What's the BOD removal? What's the TSS? What's the pathogen level? What's the nutrient level in the system? And the goal was treat the water and take it back into the, uh, into the water system. And this is where we're looking at starting recycling on a big loop, okay? And so we are trying to recover that water. And because you're using advanced technologies, system management becomes more critical because things are going to break in the process. And so this means from the big water cycle, because we look at water reuse. Have we reused our water in the past? Yes, the water didn't go away. We just put it into the big cycle, which is the water cycle or hydrologic cycle. That means the water goes into the soil. It can uh, go down and leach down to groundwater. It can evaporate up, come back down as rain again. It could uh, move laterally down through the soil and move, migrate toward our rivers and streams. And so that water essentially then is recycled on the larger water cycle side or the hydrologic cycle. But we're getting into actual water reuse now, okay? And so this is where we say we're going to put it on the little water cycle, which means now we're actually taking it back into houses. Okay, and so with the water reuse side of things, we're going to have to decide, do you want to use it just in the landscape? Because has our systems, has our on-site systems been recycling water to offset the need to irrigate trees or irrigate grass in the past? Yes, we've been putting it into the landscape and reusing it in the landscape. But now we're starting to say, wait a minute, we need to meet certain needs within, within those homes. Can we recycle it for toilet flushing inside the home? Can we recycle it for clothes washing inside the home? These are technologies, are, well, excuse me, are they being used in Texas right now? 
Yes. They are. Okay, they're on a limited scale. Uh, they're mainly on uh, larger, uh, what you would say, building scale sizes, where essentially they take the wastewater to the basement of the building, they treat it, and then they send it back up for the uh, toilet flushing and the clothes washing and things like that inside of those structures. Okay, and what this does is it takes management to a whole new level. Because the definition of working is changing, okay? If that water has a little bit of offensive odor when the spray heads go off, people will put up with it. But when you take it back into the master bedroom, are they going to accept it to have a little bit of odor? Is that good news or bad news for this industry? Is it good or bad? Good. Why is it good? More work. Well, why are you going to have more work? Because you're going to have to treat the water more. Because the definition of working has changed. Okay? And their concept of the wastewater coming out of the spray heads, where they can essentially ignore it at night, or they can ignore it during other parts of the day, is going to change. And somebody's going to get mad if that uh, wastewater smells up the whole house when it comes back in. So from a perspective of being a true professional, providing full service to your customers, this is a good thing because they're going to make different decisions regarding whether or not they want to fix that malfunctioning component because it's directly impacting their life. And so as an industry, we should be excited about this. The other thing though is if you're cutting corners on the design and you're cutting corners on the installation, the homeowners are going to be very upset. And as the dollars go up, you need to realize that a lot of times the legal side of things doesn't really pay attention because the dollars aren't there. But if you take a home that is based on a reuse system and you make that home worthless, you, the dollars are there. And so as professionals, you better make sure that if you're going to jump into this arena, you better be ready for it because it's going to be a whole new ball game as far as value and what your liability is going to be if that system doesn't perform the way it's supposed to be. And you're not going to be liable for just the system. They're going to come after you for the value of the home because that home, what is the value of that home without a working system? Not much. So that's where your liability is going to go up. So this is a good thing, but you need to be careful before you jump because it means your, your business better be in order because management is going to be super critical. The rev, this uh, evolution, how, why, why in the world does our rules say that local jurisdictions can be more stringent than the state standards? They recognize that different areas of the state are at different levels of evolution in the process. So what you have, Texas is a very big state. One guy I used to work with that essentially we would go out and talk about groundwater districts and stuff. He said, think about it. If everybody got issued a size 10 shoe, you'd end up with some people that are very happy. You'd end up with other ones that had a lot of sore feet. Okay. And so what this does is as we look at the evolution or the ability for us to be more stringent in the local areas, it means that essentially we can evolve as the demands come in in that local area. And so there's drivers that make it happen. And limited water resources is a big issue for the state of Texas. And again, I'm not saying Texas is going to run out of water. We have lots of water. It just means we're not going to have as much cheap water which means you are a provider of water solutions for people, and that means your value is going up in the overall process. And so limited water resources is a huge driver. Environmental concerns, those are out there. But a lot of people, some people are motivated by environmental concerns, some are not. The other one is source water protection. When we look at drinking water supplies around lakes, the only thing that, uh, one thing you're gonna be sure of is when you're around a lake and that is a water supply, the regulations and controls on the wastewater around those lakes are gonna go up because as we start fully utilizing our water resources, what happens to your dilution potential? 
It goes down. We used to say that the solution to pollution was dilution. You just ran out of dilution, okay, in the process. And so we don't have that ability anymore. We're going to have to meet that needs. And as we look at you drinking that water, we need to make sure we're preparing it. And public health and public safety, those are drivers also that really impact uh, how we're going to change and how we're going to address those needs in, in their individual areas. Now, some of the players that we have, I'm going to go through, and essentially, the big one is the authorized agent. That is the local entity that's out there, and they're critical because they're going to define what activities need to occur in that jurisdiction because they're wrapped up in this evolution process, and they have to decide what do we need to do in order to meet our long-term wastewater needs in our area. And they're going to have to step out beyond the state minimum in order to define in their jurisdiction and in their local order how they're going to meet that public health and public safety and environmental health and environmental safety issues in their area. And they're going to have to look at the water resources planning in the future and how they mesh into that overall process. And then it falls down to the designated representative. They are the key person because they're the ones that then become the ones that have to implement that local order and figure out how to make it work. And our rules, I said they're good, but they're not perfect, okay? And there's a lot of areas that we have to work through, especially as we push this limit of evolution. And your designated representative becomes your key person that's essentially on the front line that has to make the decisions of how it's actually gonna work in the local area. And the problem is that if we don't help the public understand where they are in the evolution process, what does that person need and the uh, authorized agent need, that entity need, in order to be able to make things happen on a local area? They need public will. Public will means to lead to the process of making those things happen. And so, if we don't help the public understand where we are in this process, then they're not going to get the local support they need in order to make these things happen. But it is the, this issue of local things fitting local areas, that's where we have to make sure that we're getting that support we need in order to get, make things occur. The site evaluator, their critical role is defining what the soil can do. Okay, the soil is good and can provide a lot of treatment, but they have to be the ones that essentially say, how much can this site do as far as accepting and treating wastewater? And then what do we need to improve the quality of that water to actually be able to go on to that site? Professional designs. These uh, professionals that are supposed to be providing the designs we need, the professional sanitarians, the professional engineers, they are faced with a lot of changing challenges that are out there. And so these people essentially are the ones that are supposed to be keeping up with their professional knowledge, put, developing appropriate designs that actually meet what the goal is for treatment and having the size and capacity that's there. And so they are very critical, especially as we're moving into this uh, professional design arena. And those individuals are also going to be wrapped up in this new concept of uh, water reuse and value. And so liability is going to go up on these professional designers. Installers, they're the ones that essentially impact the local choices. When the designer comes up with a design and they send it out for bid, essentially how the installers respond to that particular design means whether or not the homeowner is actually going to implement it or not. Because when it gets into the local arena and you have all these quotes coming in, typically the homeowner wants what? The cheapest. the cheapest. The homeowner's looking for the cheapest. The reality is the designer can do the best job of designing a system exactly what they need. But if every installer they go to or nine out of 10 tell them, you don't need that. You just need 500 gallon ATU, no trash tank and a thousand square feet of spray field. All that is just extra in the process. So if that's what they hear, then we're not moving forward. So the installer is the one that essentially has to essentially help in the process 
to make sure when good designs do come out and get implemented in an area that people actually understand why those design requirements are in there. And so the installer also defines whether or not that system is a long-term option that's going to treat the wastewater or it's a ticking time bomb that's going to explode on the homeowner okay, in the process. And so that's where the installer is the one that defines whether or not that system is a long-term system and it's going to be operational and maintainable in the uh, system. The apprentice, there are skilled, skilled people for putting things together. We need good long-term systems. And so that means it's installed well and it's going to last and they need to be there. The maintenance provider. These individuals become the ones that get the finger pointed to because they're the ones that show up after the system is installed. Okay, and the homeowner or the owner of that facility may not have understood what the designer said. They may not have understood what the designated representative said. They may not have understood what the installer said, but they now understand what they have. Okay, and they may or may not be happy with what they have on that site. And so the maintenance provider is the one that essentially is going to show up and they're the one that's going to get the full brunt of the force of this is what I ended up with. Okay, and they're going to have to decide how they respond to that homeowner. They can either respond in a way that helps them understand what they have and how they can get to what they really need in the process. And so this, these individuals, which is the maintenance provider and their representative, which is the maintenance technician and the designated representative, those are your three critical people that really need to understand why we're where we're at. Because when it comes to homeowner education, many people have said, Bruce, why didn't you just educate all the homeowners in the state of Texas? Okay. And the problem is People aren't going to listen unless it's a teachable moment. When is it a teachable moment? When you're asking them to pull out their checkbook to fix something, that is a teachable moment. Okay? And they were not really interested in paying attention up to that point. And now when they got to figure out what it's really going to cost, you have a teachable moment because you have their attention. Okay? In that process. And so... That's why when it comes down to our professionals that are in the field, you've got to be able to answer people as to why their world has changed, why granddad's system won't work anymore, and why we need to be where we are in the process. And understanding that evolution of the changing of the rules that we're now talking about water treatment, we're talking about water reuse, this is where we need to be, and that if you made the choice that you wanted to live in Texas and you made the choice you wanted to live on that lake and you made the choice that you wanted to live in that subdivision, then this is what it's going to take in order to treat the wastewater. And there are a few jurisdictions that say, if you really don't want that choice, there is an option. You can put a for sale sign and you can move to another jurisdiction that doesn't have those requirements. Okay, but you're not going to impact our drinking water supply. You're not going to impact our local river because that local river is a huge dollar value to this area and your one house is not going to make a difference, okay, in the process. And so from that standpoint, that becomes a very critical understanding for them of where they fit in the overall process. And it's not a good position for them to be in at that point, and it's not really a good position for that maintenance provider, maintenance technician, or the designated representative. But, because they're getting the phone calls in that process of helping them understand where they are. But we have to have the answer of trying to work through, this is where we are, and this is where the future is. Another one is the pumper. That's another individual that is, uh, provides a service in the state of Texas. And right now, essentially, the pump truck gets, uh, gets registered with the state, and the action of pumping the tanks is removing of the solids. And at this time, there really is an authorization to license that individual or requiring a, a training or registration for those in the person that's performing that action. But the challenge you get into is 
Pumping is one thing, maintenance is another. And once you cross the line and you move into maintenance activities, which has assumption of uh, conducting those uh, routine activities, cleaning components, cleaning up the pump screens, cleaning up the other components that are in the system to make sure that they're performing as they're supposed to, those are maintenance activities. And who, is the, uh, who are the individuals that are supposed to be providing those activities? The maintenance provider. So we have an issue that when you, the pumper, does the pumper have to be licensed or registered in the state of Texas as an individual? No, as long as they're just pumping the tank. But once they move into other activities that are beyond that from the maintenance side, now they're essentially doing things where the definition of a maintenance person is they're essentially getting compensation for performing maintenance activities. And so we have a, a line that we have to work through of how that particular individual is going to work within our rules overall. And the owner, they are essentially ultimately responsible for that facility at that site and how we help them understand what they need to do in order to keep it working. And the main thing is they need to understand the value. What is the value of a good working OSSF? In the maintenance class, we essentially end up with a lot of different people coming through. Many of them are homeowners, but we're also getting people visiting from homeowners associations. Why would a homeowners association send an individual representative to the maintenance, basic maintenance provider course? Because they're interested in what is required. Are they, do they really care what's required? No, what are they really interested in? Maintaining value of the property. So homeowners associations are interested in maintaining the value of the property. They're trying to understand what these people are supposed to be doing so that they maintain their value. And so that's where the owners start to get an understanding of what is the value of a good OSSF and what does that mean? And as property values go up in the state of Texas, the value of what you're providing is going to do what? Go up, okay, in the deal. And so that's what we're faced with is, we're faced with that you essentially are a significant part of the, uh, the long-term global picture of what we're doing, but also you have something that's gonna be of significant value to those property owners and how they essentially are going to maintain and be on that individual property. A malfunctioning OSSF, this is where we're getting into that we've got to look at a uh, little bit of a definition issue. And part of it is that as we struggle with the, the public health, public safety, environmental health, environmental safety issues, we're having to look at this malfunctioning OSSF. And so as we look at it, we need to say, okay, is it a situation right now that a system is providing an immediate public health, public safety issue, or, or environmental health, environmental safety, or is it something that is a, a notification to the owner that a component is not working? So a soft malfunction is one that's not causing immediate risk, a hard malfunction is. So from the standpoint of a component not working in the system, if the riser lid is broken on the system, what type of malfunction is that? hard because if that riser lid does not function and we said that system needs to be securable and limit access from a public safety side so the riser is your limitation of access and that is an immediate thing that should be dealt with and that's why you say when you sign off on your on your reports you say the system is secured okay in the process so if the, if the high level float doesn't signify an alarm, is that a hard or soft malfunction? Soft, because it is a notification to the owner there's a problem, but can the system treat wastewater without that high level alarm working? Yes. If the aerator does not work, if there's no air entering an aerobic unit, 
What type of a malfunction is that? Hard, because you're not going to treat wastewater in an aerobic system without air. So that's where we have to realize how are we going to deal with this uh, fixing malfunctioning systems? Because owners need to understand where the line is, and the easiest is to base it off of public health, public safety, environmental health, and environmental safety. If that is the issue, then it needs to be fixed or you need to get out of there because that is an immediate risk system that is going to develop liability for everybody that's involved with it in the process. And so we need to figure out how we're going to deal with owners that don't want to fix or address those issues because that's a lit risk for everybody involved. When we look at the on-site system, it has different parts. It's got the source, the collection, the pretreatment, and then the final treatment dispersal. And we look at that uh, source is a critical part. And we need to define, is that a residential system? Is it a commercial system? What type of activities are going on in there? Because the first part of the on-site system is the owner. The owner is the one that defines how that treatment system is going to function. And they have ultimate responsibility for what they put down the drain and whether or not that system continues to work. We have collection systems. We have options now whether or not we want to separate black water and gray water from the system. And so as we deal with those systems of separating the black water and the gray water, we're going to have to deal with the two cues, the quantity of water and the quality of water, because they are not, those are both design parameters that you have to address. You have a quantity of water that's there to convey the waste, and you have the amount of waste that's in the water. And so our risk is that we don't put a system in place that can address that individual waste stream. So separating those waste streams into black water and gray water is a high risk right now because that's another one that's going to teach you whether or not you understand the two cues of wastewater. So you have to design that system for what the waste stream is going to be in that process. The pretreatment, we have lots of options, and we have new options that are coming in. Is this list going to expand over the years? Yes, because as we look at other ways to meet our long-term water needs and our water quality goals and our public health and public safety, we're going to change stuff. We're going to have different ways to not only disperse the water out into the system, we're going to have ways to reuse that water. But really what it comes down to is risk. The risk of public health, public safety, the environmental side is all comes down. And so when we look at that risk, how do we manage that system? And this is the component that we have to do, the risk of the system itself, the risk of the owner and how they act with it. And we have to manage all those risks in the system. So the main risk, as far as the system itself, we have site conditions, the loading rate, the technology. Those are the things that we as designers, installers, uh, maintenance professionals can deal with is the site itself. And we do our best job of putting the system on that site that'll match up with that homeowner. So when we look at the risk of the site, is it a soil that can actually treat wastewater? So if it is a soil that can treat wastewater, it's a minimal risk from the standpoint of public health, public safety, and environmental health, environmental safety. But once we have a situation that we put the wastewater on top of the ground, or we have to go to a water reuse system, or you have limited soil on the site, it becomes a higher risk to public health, public safety, environmental health, environmental safety. Also, loading rate. If you're in an area that has the ability with homes right next to all each other, that is a high risk situation because everybody can share their wastewater, okay? And so it's very easy for you to transmit across those property lines in that system. And so that subdivision that has relatively small lots and wastewater in it is an easy way to share stuff rather quickly in the uh, process. Once you go to larger tracts of land, 
it's less risk of sharing across the property line, but it doesn't mean that they can't cause a problem. They still can cause an environmental problem. They can still cause a public health issue if they don't manage their wastewater properly. And system complexity. What does the system have to do in order to work? When you're looking at a septic tank, it's pretty easy because as long as gravity works, you're going to get separation. You're going to get the solids to sink, the stuff to float, and clarified water in the middle. Once you, when you go to that advanced treatment system, if the pump stops working or the aerator stops working, things are going to get difficult in order to treat wastewater. So the technology that's implemented is a risk that has to be dealt with and managed, and that's why we need to do service more frequently to those systems. So we look at the risk of malfunction based on the treatment process and the loading of how much waste we're putting in a small area. What is the challenge with all these people moving in? We're packing them into a smaller area. So as we put more and more load into those small areas, as well as on Mother Nature, we're going to have to address that wastewater loading. But now we have to say, wait a minute, the treatment system is only part of the issue. It's the homeowner that's the other, okay, and the size of the system they have. And so as they use water that moves and waste load and moves closer to the design of that system, we got to figure out, is the system going to malfunction? And so generally we look at if the average daily flow is less than 70% of design capacity, then that system has the ability to handle the peaks and valleys and potentially treat the wastewater. But as we go to greater than 70% of, of the design capacity, now all of a sudden we go from a scenario where the ups and downs of the waste flow, because do people do the same thing every day in their home or in their facility? No. So what does average mean? It's the, you take the, the peaks and the valleys, you add them together, divide it by the number of days, and you get the average. So as that average moves closer to design, such as here you're at 70% of design, and here you're at 90% of design, what does that mean that the upper peaks are doing? They're exceeding what the system was ever designed to handle. So is that the problem of the designer? Is that the problem of the installer? Is that the problem of the maintenance provider? No. Whose problem is it? The owner. Okay. They have to, they have essentially have a system that essentially is designed for specific capacity. And they need to figure out how they're going to now bring that system back in line from a use perspective. It's a use issue. So the homeowners have what options? Change the way they use it or, or make the system be able to match their lifestyle. Okay, and so that's where we got to say, what can we do in order to be able to make that system match their lifestyle? And this is where as we move from the greater than 70% issue, that means that they're either going to be paying you to be there a lot more to do maintenance, because as the system gets overloaded, then you're going to be able to do the maintenance. How many of you have maintenance contracts that say that if they get over 70% of design, they need to pay you more? You don't? Why not? Because what's the end result? If they're loading it at greater than that design rate, are they going to pay you more? Yes. yes, because it's going to show up in things breaking. So you might as well do it up front on the contract that says, if you're greater than 70% design, you need to pay me more. Because then when they sign off on that contract, they've already ad admitted to that if they don't control their use, whose fault is it? theirs because they chose not to essentially live within the system and then you can go now wait a minute we had this discussion when we were starting with the contract and we told you that you were going to pay us more so now let's discuss the options on how we're going to deal with it because I'm happy to come out here every two weeks 
and work on your system as long as you're willing to pay me. But if you don't want me to be here every two weeks, we can change, either help you change your habits or we can add stuff. And what can you add? You can essentially add flow equalization to the system that will actually capture the water and then, and then evenly distribute the water to the treatment components and make it work better. So flow equalization is a way that homeowners that are still living within the design capacity can actually make it work in overall. But it's not, it's not your fault that the system essentially is being used more than what it was designed to. They need to understand what their limitations are. Because can you take care of all the wastewater that they want to generate? If they're willing to pay for it, yes. And it's called a pump and haul, okay? But you can't necessarily put it all into the treatment system if the system is not designed for that capacity. So what has changed in the last 25 years? One, uh, the population. The population has grown in the state of Texas. And so every time we add another person, we're adding waste load, we're adding water usage. And so that is a good thing for us in the industry. Our rules have evolved. We essentially are set up now to address what we need for the long term. We're set up for getting treatment of the water. We're set up for reusing the water overall in the process. Additionally, the OSSF is a permanent part of the wastewater infrastructure because you had two options to deal with wastewater, either on site or in a centralized sewer. Okay, and when we recognized in 1997 that on-site systems were here to stay, that's when a lot of the rule changes occurred in order to drive it that we were going to be able to maintain our systems. And so is that a good news that it's a permanent part of the infrastructure? Why is that good news? Because if they're going to be there, because how long does that system have to be there? Forever. In order for it to be there forever, what's got to happen? Maintain it. Okay, and so from, the, from a standpoint of significance, you have serious significance to meet the long-term water needs of the state of Texas and the ability to do it. We need the professional licensing is there. Uh, we've upgraded uh, as we've uh, seen the value of these different components. Educational resources are there. We have documentation and stuff we can deal with in order to educate homeowners and help them understand how their lifestyle impacts that treatment system. Water reuse is coming in, that we are going to be reusing our water, not only in the landscape, but inside the home. And that is good news from the standpoint of people that really want to put in good, solid systems. Uh, in that process. And we have technologies that give us the ability to perform the uh, treatment needs that we have. We can perform the maintenance and we can even get remote access. So over time we've seen those changes in Texas that prepare us. The rules have changed and the evolution that's there. And you need to help the public understand why they can't do the same thing they did that granddad did as far as wastewater treatment systems. That helps them be prepared also, we have the professionals in a place and how you conduct yourself with the public and how you educate the public on the evolution of those rules and why things need to be changed. That defines your significance because the reality is and your long term viability because is the service that we're providing going to go away? No, but the answer is if we don't provide that service, somebody will. Okay, in the process, because public health, public safety, environmental health, environmental safety, and our water resources are going to drive it. And so we have to keep that in the forefront. And as professionals, I think we have a bright future in the state of Texas. And with that, I thank you and, and appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today.